All right, everybody. It is 1225, and I am still here all by my lonesome self, um, which is totally fine. Uh, again, we have a small class, and attendance at the Zoom is optional. Uh, but that means what I'm going to do is sort of very quickly present the information that I have prepared, and I will sort of ask you to message me, email me, text me, come to office hours, meet with me outside of office hours, whatever you need to do if you have questions about this important material, right? Because this is week two of our poetry uh, sort of unit in this class. Last week, I talked about some of the basic elements of poetry and understanding some of the basic structural elements of poetry. Uh, you can go back and watch the Zoom recording if you have questions about that or if you weren't here. Today, I'm going to talk about the sort of deeper levels of poetic structure and specifically, as I say here on this slide, poetic rhythm and poetic rhythm is connected to something called meter, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you remember, I'll, I'll make my face large here for a moment, so again, if you remember from last week, and again, if, if you haven't watched the video from last week yet, please go back and rewatch it. But just to sort of quickly summarize, you know, there are many different ways to create a rhythm, right? To create the sort of way that the poet wants the reader to read the poem and understand the poem. Last week, we talked about individual sounds, right? Things like alliteration, consonants and assonants. We talked about where we get those pauses, how the reader knows to slow down when we talked about cesura, punctuation, right? Comma and period, most often. And enjambment. And if you remember, enjambment means starting a new line of poetry without any punctuation, but the meaning of that line continues, right? And again, we saw that last week. So the other way that a poet can create some rhythm in the poem is what I just said, right? Lines and stanzas. That was the most sort of basic element of poetic structure that we talked about last week, right? So last week, what did we review? Lines and stanzas. Where does the poet break the line and start a new one, right? And then how does the poet group lines together to create stanzas? That's sort of the most basic way to think about creating rhythm. And then the next way that a poet uh, can create rhythm, which we talked about last week, is sound, right? Is sound, consonants, assonance, uh, and alliteration. Because the words that we put in a specific order will sort of make the reader speed up or slow down, whatever, sort of depending on the order of the words and, and the order of the sounds that they see in the poem. Okay, and then finally, enjambment, right? Enjambment and cesura. That's like a big, you know, like a road sign, like a stop sign when you're driving, you know, you see a period, stop, you know, change your rhythm, slow down, slow down, slow down. Okay, so that's what we talked about last week. Today, I'm gonna talk about rhythm and specifically something called meter, right? And I will post this PowerPoint slide, um, but I also have prepared a Word document for us today. It's not that one. I've got a bunch of stuff open here. Okay. Now this document will also be in Canvas for you to review. All right, everybody. But let me make it large. Okay. So as I say here, the three main ways that poet can create rhythm, as I said, cesura and enjambment, which we talked about last time, rhyme, which we talked about last time and we will talk about again, and syllables. And really syllables are what I want us to focus on here as we think about um, meter, okay, and rhythm. So there is a, a structure, right, a, a specific type of poem, very specific to the Japanese language, but we have some famous examples of translation of these poems, and it's called a haiku. And that's the word right there on your screen, haiku. Haiku is such a special type of poem or style of poem that there are very strict rules about the structure of Japanese haiku. And in fact, 
right? The rules are only about syllables, the number of syllables. A Japanese haiku is one stanza, three lines, and those three lines follow this strict uh, uh, rhythm, right? For how many syllables in each line. So Japanese haiku is five syllables in line one, seven syllables in line two, five syllables in line three. Now we're gonna look at this very short example, right? <laughs> um, but notice that even in this example, we've got things like caesuras, right? We've got a bunch of punctuation here and be aware of the sounds, right? Even though we're focused on rhythm, we cannot forget about things like consonants, assonance, and alliteration because a poem really is the combination of all these things, right? Sounds, structure, rhythm, that all comes together with the symbols, like we talked about last week, to help explain why we have the type of emotional response that we have to a poem, right? So keep all that in mind, but really we're focused on syllables here, right? We're talking about syllables and meter. So this is from Mat Uso Basho, a Japanese haiku master. It's a very old, old poem. And here's the poem. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash. Silence again. It's that simple, right? But notice if you look at the lines here, five syllables. Un, old, si, lunt, pond. Five syllables. A frog jumps in to the pond, seven syllables. Splash, si, lens, uh, again, five syllables, right? I like to show you guys haiku, right? Because one, it's easy, right? Uh, you know, in a, in a really basic class, like if I'm teaching poetry, that's not a, this is a transfer level class. You know, you can use this class for your major. But if I'm teaching sort of a non-credit or basic poetry workshop, I, I like to ask students to write haiku because it's such an easy and basic way to practice this, this syllables skill, right? Okay, so uh, haiku is a good, easy form to show you because it's entirely about syllables, right? Five, seven, five. But of course, it gets much more interesting and complicated than this, right? And, and there's one really important thing that we need to think about and be aware of in English poetry. And it's not just the number of syllables, but that can be very important, right? But even more important than this is, uh, and here's my sort of summary, right, of what I just said, Japanese haiku is all about how the meter creates the rhythm. One stanza, three lines, and it's all about syllables, five, seven, five. Now, the other thing though that you need to consider when we think about syllables is syllables, meter, and stress, right? And now this is what can be very difficult for uh, multilingual students and uh, sort of people who are learning uh, to be comfortable with the English language when they're thinking about poetry because when we get words, excuse me, that have more than one syllable, of course, those words will have a specific stress in specific syllables. So for example, the word freedom, for example, right? It's a two syllable word, freedom, right? But for poetry, and especially English language poetry, it's important to be aware of where the stress is, right? So in the word freedom, we have to be aware and understand that the stress is on the first syllable free, right? It's freedom, not freedom. And another example, uh, I'm thinking of more ex a, a sort of standard American, um, <laughs> sort of American government words here that we love to talk about uh, in, in the US. So how about liberty, liberty, 
liberty. Hopefully you're, you're thinking, ooh, how many syllables? How many syllables? Three. Right? The word liberty has three syllables. And I'll say it a few more times and, and try and focus. Where's the stress? Liberty. 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 Right? Once again, the stress here is on the first syllable. And like I said, for, for multilingual students, for people who are learning English, this can be really difficult because sometimes we're not really sure where the stress is especially in longer words. How about a word like um, exceptionally? Again, as I say the word, just think how many syllables in exceptionally? Exceptionally. Ex, sep, sh, n, li. This is a five syllable word. And I would break it up like this, ex, se, uh, sep, sh, uh, li. I could do the same thing here to make sure you guys see the breaks in the syllables in these words. And where's our stress in exceptionally? I'll give you, I'll try and practice putting it in different places here too. So is it ex, exceptionally, exceptionally? Exceptionally, exceptionally, exceptionally. <laughs> this is like a pronunciation class. Exceptionally, right? Exceptionally. And we'll do just one more example. So hopefully this sinks in for you. How about a nice and easy one? Um, wonderful. How many syllables in wonderful? Wonderful, right? This is three syllable word. Wonderful. And the first syllable gets the stress. Wonderful, not wonderful and not wonderful, right? Okay, so I know that was a very, very quick review of, of, of why uh, syllable and stress matters in English words. So I'll say one more thing again, if people were here, we could ask questions, but it's all good. If you go to Learner's Dictionary and you look, uh, and if you look up the word, oh, excuse me. I'm, I wanted to see, make sure you can see, if, if you see a word in a poem, for example, and you're not sure about pronunciation, you can always go to Learner's Dictionary to hear the pronunciation. Sorry, I'm giving you guys bad advice here. Hold on. Um, I thought that it gave us the syllable stress in um, Learner's Dictionary, but excuse me while I search for this. Word stress on the free dictionary. Let's see if the... Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, it breaks up. So it breaks up the syllables. At least that's some help, right? You see, wonderful. Or if I do exceptional, 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 right? Uh, but uh, I don't think, I think they're trying to give us the stress down here in these examples where they put this little apostrophe here. If I can find a better website that will, will um, just give you the answer for where the stressed syllable is, uh, I will give that to you. But at least if you look at freedictionary.com here or learner's dictionary, you can see the number of syllables and that is important, right? That's important to have some awareness of. Exceptional. Exceptional. Yeah, I think, see this, see this, um, it's very small. This little apostrophe here, I think, is the clue for it saying, okay, the stress is on this syllable that comes right before the apostrophe. Exceptional. Yeah, let's see if that's true. Um, 
I don't know why. Thinking. Thinking. Yeah, thinking. Two syllables, and the stress is on the first. And here's the little apostrophe. How about um, confusing? Confuse. Ah, interesting. So they didn't give us the adjective form. They gave us the verb. But even here, again, the little apostrophe is at the end of the second syllable, and that is it's confuse, right? Not confuse. Confuse. Okay. So I think this website is a little more clear than Learner's Dictionary. Um, let me give you one more. Uh, how about poetry, since that's what we're talking about? Poetry. Yeah, and there's the syllable stress, right? Poetry. 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 Little apostrophe before, right after, excuse me, the first syllable. Poetry. Okay. So that might be really helpful as you're thinking about how to identify stressed syllables, the number of syllables when you're looking at poems, right? And especially in English, because like I said, this, um, uh, you know, the, the, the American English version of, of the haiku is what, what I wanted to talk about next. And basically it is entirely right. The, the rules are almost entirely about stressed and unstressed syllables. Like that's, that's the most basic and important thing uh, that you can be aware of with English poetry. And let me show you why, <laughs> because in English, in English, there is something called pentameter. Excuse me, let's just focus on I am's, right? And I am, Right. Iambic is an adjective here, you guys. But an I am in English poetry is two syllables that follow a pattern of unstressed, stressed. That's it. Right. And th what I just deleted when I say iambic pentameter. What this means is pentameter here, uh, this comes from um, meter, literally meter, right? And then pentameter, you can have all types of um, different forms of meter, but pentameter refers to the number of um, syllables in a specific line. And iambic pentameter, exactly as I say here, right? Is 10 syllables, 10 syllable lines of iams. Right, uh, ten syllable lines of unstressed and stressed syllables, and that means there are five iams in a ten syllable line, right? Because each iam is two syllables. But even more important than this is, as I say here, right? This is my way to sort of try and explain this. Imagine that when I say U is unstressed, S is stressed, and here's where the iam ends. So here's iam one. Here's I am two, I am three, I am four, I am five. And it's unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. Uh, when I was doing theater in university and we were performing Shakespeare, here's the line that my teacher taught us to use. This is uh, uh, Shakespeare now. Okay, so all of William Shakespeare's plays and poetry uh, almost all <laughs> are in iambic pentameter, right? And when people think of sort of some of the great figures or people in um, English language literary history, of course, Shakespeare is at the very, very top of that list. But even people before and after Shakespeare have used this iambic pentameter, this rhythm of unstressed stress uh, in lots of different situations and lots of different examples. But here, this is the line, this is from A Midsummer Night's Dream, the play A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare that our, our teacher, my freshman year at university, my first year at university used us to get comfortable with iambic pentameter and to understand unstressed, stressed rhythm, right? So here's the line, I am amazed and know not what to say, right? And let's just count the syllables first, right? I am amazed and no, not what to say. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, right? So again, 10 syllables. And here's where the stressed and unstressed comes in, right? So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, there's not an easy or beautiful way to do this. I'm gonna try and make it bold and underlined to show you the stressed syllables, just like I did um, in our example words up above, right? So let's do the same here. Remember, the rules of iambic pentameter tell us it has to be unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. It has to be that way. And I'm sort of telling you right now, this line is an iambic pentameter, right? So first syllable, unstressed. Second syllable, stressed. I am amazed, right? That's two syllables. And just like we would normally say the word, the stress in that two syllable word by itself is on the second syllable. It's amazed, not amazed. So here Shakespeare put that, you know, in the correct place for iambic pentameter, right? Two syllable word. He wants to make sure that the first syllable goes in an unstressed section of the line and the second stressed syllable matches with the stress. He got it, right? So I am amazed. And no, right, conjunctions, prepositions, here's a heads up, are very often unstressed. And here we get a content word, right, a word with rich meaning. And no, same thing, auxiliary not, or adverb not, right? What to say, right? I am amazed and no, not what to say. And this really short example, right? This really short example of iambic pentameter really is the most important meter, right? The most important rhythm in English language poetry. There are lots of other different ways that poets have played with rhythm and meter, but iambic pentameter, and even if it's not pentameter, right? Even if it's not 10 syllables, but iams, this rhythm of unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, is the heartbeat of English language poetry. It really, really is, right? It really, really is. So much so, right, that if you've started, I'll, I'll go back to Canvas just for a second here. If you've started or if you've looked at uh, this lesson here where I ask you to um, analyze the rhythm of, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, wrong lesson. <laughs> In lesson 11, I asked you just to respond to the poem Fire and Ice, right? Fire and Ice. And I see some people have already posted, thank you so much. But let's go back to that poem of Fire and Ice. And you'll start to notice this, this rhythm, this, these I am's that rule the world here in English language poetry, right? Okay, so I'll read through the poem and notice, let's just say right away. Some say the world will end in fire. Some, we're, we're counting syllables here together, okay? Some, one, say, two, the, three, world, four, will, five, end, six, seven, eight. So this cannot be iambic pentameter, right? Because this is only eight syllables. So let's just go through the, the, this together because counting syllables is a great place to start, right? First of all, we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines. Nine lines. One stanza, no breaks, right? No breaks, just nine lines in a row. And then let's look at the syllables. Some, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. From, from what? I've tasted of desire, excuse me, eight, I missed one. It's important to say it out loud. <laughs> and how about here? I hold with those who favor fire, fire, fi fire, fire, fire. Tricky, maybe eight or nine, we're not sure. 
Would you say fire or fire? Fire, fire. Some words might, you know, you can kind of split it, right? One or two syllables. But if it had to perish twice, eight syllables for sure. I think I know enough of hate. Notice a, notice, notice a pattern here, you guys, <laughs> to say that for destruction, ice eight is all so great and would suffice. Now, when you notice this, right, we, we can almost certainly say, okay, well, then he wants us to say fire like one syllable, because we've clearly got lines of only eight syllables, right? Eight, four, eight, 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 four, four. So again, this is not iambic pentameter, right, you guys? And we're not going to do Shakespeare in this class. It's too much. It's way too much for us. But I do want you to understand that... Uh, Iambic pentameter has to mean 10 syllables in a line. Iambic pentameter has to mean 10 syllables in a line. And we don't have 10 syllables in these lines. But the question that I do want you to think about as we go through this poetry unit is, are there iams? This is important in English poetry, right? If you only remember one thing about meter and rhythm in English poetry, this is it. It's iams and it's unstressed stress. Because we can use that iambic structure, that iambic rhythm, that iambic meter without having 10 syllables in a line. So we only have eight and four here, but you probably heard me falling into the iambic pattern, the iambic rhythm, when I was reading the poem out loud, because let's just test, right? Let's just test. We'll go back and forth. Let's, let's try iams and see. Some say the world will end in fire. That would be unstressed stressed, right? Now let's try it the other way. Let's try stressed, unstressed. Some say the world will end in fire. <laughs> and I, it's honestly, it's hard for me to, to show you guys this um, because it's hard to think about examples where I don't just naturally fall into iambic rhythm because it's such a part of English poetry. But, but let's try putting maybe like some stressed syllables together. And, and so for example, some say the world, will end in fire, some say in ice. It, it's, 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 it's like I said, it's, it's really hard for me to fight iambic rhythm because it's so common. And to me, it feels very clearly obvious that we have some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Right. Now, again, I know this is hard for for English language learners, because, of course, this doesn't just feel like a natural rhythm, maybe for you guys. Right. This is not um, this. This I, I strongly believe right now. I'm just going to talk for a second. You know, poetry. Really is pure art and. Um, I get really excited and I get really emotional when I talk about poetry because because for me as a language lover, you know, and I definitely love language. I love all languages. I love expression and creativity and originality. But as a language lover, you know, I, I, I just really strongly believe that there is no higher form. There is no more perfect expression of what a language is capable of by itself than poetry, you know? I think poetry is sort of like a like a like a, a reflection of the soul of a language almost. You know, it, it's it's so so I mentioned this when I talk about iambic pentameter because I strongly believe that just the nature of the English language, right? The way that it has evolved, the way that humans have used it, um, just by by 
right? No one sat down and said, ah, it's time that we make sure that English loves I ams, right? English loves stressed unstressed. No. And there are, you know, geniuses, PhDs, you know, scholars in, you know, Harvard and Yale and, you know, whatever, Oxford, and they will have, you know, interesting debates about why, why I am, right? What is it about the English language that makes I am such a natural part of our rhythm? But the real answer is we don't know, you know, that's sort of the way that the language has evolved. And, and um, so I know that it's not, it doesn't feel as natural to people who are learning the English language, uh, you know, later in life or for the first time or whatever. So I don't, what I don't want is for people to feel disappointed if they don't naturally see this rhythm, or if when we talk about iambic pentameter, or when you talk about iams, when we talk about stress, if you're like, I don't know where the stress is, man. I don't know. <laughs> you know. I don't know if this syllable is stressed or not stressed. That's okay, right? That's okay. But what I do ask you to at least be aware of is that this rhythm of unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, it's really the defining feature of English language poetry. Um, and again, you can put that in your body, boom, 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 boom. Again, when we were studying Shakespeare at university and getting ready to, you know, in, in a live performance to say the words out loud, we do it on the desk too, right? Boom, 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 boom. Because it really is a rhythm that we use, <laughs> right? Um, so I am unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, whether it's William Shakespeare or as we're going to look at in this class, Robert Frost or Emily Dickinson or some of the most famous American poets, because many of the poems that I've, I've put into our Word document this semester um, are English, uh, English language, but very specifically American poets. I, I wanted to give you guys a sort of you know, very basic introduction to some of the most important uh, poets from the United States of America. Um, yeah, I hope that you guys can start to be aware of iambic rhythm, iambic meter, right? Because it is so important. So to that end, let's go back to um, fire and ice here, right? So some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've taken, Did of desire I hold with those who fay ver fire, but if it had to pay rich twice. I think I know enough of hate to say that for, here we get a long syllable word, right? Destruction. Destruct, destru, destruction. Ice is all so great and would suffice. Right. It's pure iambic, right? This is pure iambic rhythm. It's unstressed, stressed all the way down, even though he breaks it up into different lines, even though he has different number of syllables in each line. Um, so again, I'll read through it one more time. And maybe when you look at the stress, it'll help you see. So this is Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in fire. 
some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. I'll read it one more time. Uh, and, and then, you know, especially with no one here, I want to be really care careful about um, going into too much depth and too much detail uh, without people being able to ask questions. Um, but I'd say this, as I read it again, listen to how I read it and, and um, try to ask yourself, why did the author, in this case, Robert Frost, right? Why did Robert Frost put this word, this sound, this syllable in a place of stress? Because this really is the poet's magic, right? Understanding this natural rhythm of the English language and then choosing which sounds, which words, which meanings to put in stressed positions. And I'll say, especially when you think about this line here, right? Especially here in, in line five. Okay. Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So if you notice here, I said that often poets do not put prepositions in stressed syllables, and that is absolutely true. However, <laughs> notice that this comes in line five after a full caesura, a full stop, and after this word, but, right, the meaning of the poem kind of changes, and now he puts this preposition if into a place of stress to help the reader draw a contrast between the first four lines, right? And then we have kind of like one line where we pivot, where we switch, and then we get sort of the last eight lines and they kind of meet in the middle in this pivot point, right? So some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Then he gives his opinion. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire, <clears throat> full stop. But, but if it had to perish twice, right? So again, if had perished twice, and then we get that much more normal rhythm where think, know, nuff, hate, right? Verb, verb, noun, verb. Now he switches down here a preposition as well because he's introducing a new element about destruction, right? So some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Notice here as well by putting also in the stressed position, that first syllable in the stressed section of the line is emphasizing and, right? He's emphasizing that we're giving some additional meaning, right? We're, we're emphasizing some additional meaning. And what I'm doing now, albeit very quickly, is trying to sort of show you how all of the things that we've talked about the last two weeks, sound, structure, rhythm, and meter come together, right? Because we haven't even talked about the symbolism in this poem or the rhymes in this poem. Of course, we know that there are, right? Fire, desire, fire, ice, twice, ice, hate, great. I forgot ice, suffice. A lot of these end of the line, right? At the end of the line, we still get rhymes. And in fact, all of the rhymes are closely connected to symbols, right? <laughs> we, we've got some repeated words here. Fire, very clearly a symbol. Ice, very clearly a symbol. 
Then he introduces this word desire and fire, which rhyme together, right? <laughs> um, so, so the challenge for poetry when we're first learning about it is um, trying to be really focused on what we want to, to analyze because trying to analyze the full depth of a poem even a nine word, a nine line poem like this, this is not a long poem, but th this is not, um, yeah, you don't have to do a deep, deep, you know, long, painful reading of the poem, but poetry is so, good poetry is so dense and rich with meaning that um, it can be difficult, right? It can be difficult. And that's why, now again, I'm gonna make my face big while I talk in this class, what I really want you to do first is focus on your personal response to the poem, right? How does the poem make you feel? What do the images give you some connection to? Uh, what does this poem make you think about? What other connections can you think of when you read this poem? And then starting to say, why? Because, right? Because, oh, the consonants in line six gave me this feeling. Okay, the image on the second stanza really gave me this uh, deeper idea or deeper feeling, right? That's the most important thing that I want us to practice in this class. I'm not gonna do, ask you to do a really deep uh, analysis of meter in English poetry. I think it's very difficult for native speakers to do this, right? And we only have a few weeks before we go back to finish our class with the novel. But again, I, I hope that with a basic introduction to iambic rhythm and iambic meter in English poetry, it will help you uh, get a deeper understanding for the, the poems that we do read in this class, right? And um, yeah, so that's iams, right? That's iams. Iambic pentameter, 10 syllables. But regardless of the number of syllables here, right? If it follows unstressed stress, you're looking at I ams. And in many of the poems that we have in our document this semester, we've got I ams, right? We've got I ams. Do I have anything else here? No, we got it. We can talk more about hope is the thing with feathers um, next week. Hopefully we'll see if we have anybody here, but uh, we can talk about that next week. So I'm gonna delete this for now. We can, we can look at this later. But as you see, when we talk about Emily Dickinson, very famous for using I am's as well, right? Okay, so that is what I have to say about uh, syllables and meter, right? And notice that rhyme is a part of this, right? Like rhyme, rhyme at the end of the line, as I said last week, it just gives us that feeling of flow and connects the lines. And, and as I quickly said here, Right. Think about what what words rhyme. What what words does the author choose to rhyme together? Okay, fire and desire. Immediately by putting those two words together with the same rhyming sound, he's linking those things. Right. The poet is linking those things in the mind of the listener. Right. Uh, let me go back and share my screen again. Yes, as I was saying. Right. Fire. Desire, fire, ice, twice, ice, suffice. Anytime you've got a rhyme, uh, the poet is linking ideas, symbols, meaning, right? Absolutely. Okay, so that'll be enough for, for, for poetic meter. We'll, we'll, we'll take a break there. And really quickly then, I just wanted to introduce three of the poets that we will see in our, um, in our poetry in this class. So as I, as I shared last week and put in the live support materials, if you go to the home page, the live support materials from last week, and right here where it says ESLW 350 poems, right here we are. Oh, there, there's someone else in here with me. <laughs> uh, or maybe someone was in here. So this poem, Harlem by Langston Hughes, sometimes with the one I love by Walt Whitman and hope is the thing with feathers. So these three people, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman and Langston Hughes are three of the most important poets in American history. And uh, the last part of this lecture today will just be me uh, telling you a little bit about them and looking very briefly at how some of these elements of meter and rhythm show up in their poems. 
Okay. So there is Emily Dickinson, just some basic information about her and why she is so important. Um, so she was born in Amherst, Massachusetts on the East Coast. Uh, she was born in 1830, lived through the American Civil War and died in 1886. Now, as I say here in the second point, uh, Emily Dickinson played with meter rhythm and slant rhymes. So she liked to play around with different rhymes as well as punctuation, almost as if she were remixing or, or playing with some of the traditional meter that was a part of English poetry that came from religious hymns, songs, and psalms. Now, a psalm is a very specific type of, of poem uh, poetic structure that comes from the Bible, right? Uh, of course, the translation of the Bible into English <laughs> uh, has nothing to do with uh, Aramaic or Greek or any of the other languages that the Bible was written in over time. Um, but in English language, this, this thing about the psalm is very important, right? Now, I don't spend a lot of time talking about psalms. We might look at it next week. We'll see how much time we have. Uh, but it's a very specific type of, of structure, also using uh, IMs. Um, and she played around with this. She innovated around this, right? Now, as I say in the, in the third point, um, she was almost entirely unknown as a poet when she was living, due largely to sexism, right? Women really were not believed to be good artists, right? It was not believed that women could be successful poets. And she was not allowed to read her poetry or, or publish her poetry. And as it says here in the, uh, in the bullet point below, she wrote over 1,800 poems and only 10 were ever published in her lifetime. But of course now, you know, 20, 2022, absolutely one of the most important and beloved and respected poets in American history. And she famously said here, here's her quote, women then have not had a dog's chance of writing poetry. That is why I have laid so much stress on money and a room of one's own. This is a so famous uh, a saying in American English that it's an idiom, a room of one's own. I need a room of my own, right? And of course, it was literally a room, a space to write poetry, but it's become so common now as an idiom that it just means I need space, I need freedom, right? I need the ability to do this thing that I'm good at. I need, I need the space and time to fulfill my goals, right? To fill my ambition. So if you ever hear someone say, you know, he finally got a room of his own, she finally got a room of her own, this is directly referencing uh, Emily Dickinson and her quote here, right? So here's an example of, of how she played with, with meter. And this is, this is one of her poems. This is the whole poem. And as I say up here, poetic meter, just another note for, for, uh, <laughs> to go along with our Word document that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, meter is a regular pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables that gives poetry a predictable rhythm. So here's her poem. It's uh, that she didn't really give her poems titles. The title is usually just the first line of the poem. So this is tell all the truth, but tell it slant. So here's the poem. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise is lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. The truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. A little older, right? over a hundred years old, maybe some vocab, it's tough, but just listen for the rhythm and then I'll show you what she's doing. You probably can guess, right? But tell all the truth but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. And as I show here on the next slide, Ah, ta-da, <laughs> stressed, unstressed, T uh, excuse me, unstressed, stressed. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, 
the truth superb surprise <laughs> as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind right uh so uh i i should go back and sort of uh get rid of this slide or make it more clear here uh but this poem is exactly in the same structure mm, of um unstressed and stressed syllables that we talked about uh, in the first document so let me fix this so that it looks more clear Success insert lies too bright for our infirm delight the truths. Herb. Surprise, right? Unstress, stress, unstress, stress. Has light meaning two. Again, a weird example here where the two gets stressed, but sometimes poets have to make it work. You know, <laughs> you, you can't always line it up perfectly when you're following the I am, uh, the I am pattern there, right? As lightning to the chilled. And eased with X, and here's a nice four syllable word here X and kind. The truth must da grab. Jelly. You'll see this poem again too. Or every man be blind. So it's just straight I ams, right? It's just straight I ams. It's unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. And we could say the same thing, right? And I am is uh, two syllables. So let's see, here's two syllables four syllables, six syllables, eight syllables. So we don't have pentameter, it's not 10 syllables, but we've got eight syllables. And if you if you notice, right, if you count all of the lines here in this poem, it's only eight lines, but uh, I believe all of, the, uh, all of the lines have eight syllables as well, so. And I see we have a student. Rafi, I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> There's no one here, so I'm just recording a video for, for you guys to watch. So. It's up to you, Rafi, if you want to stick with me, but I don't want to go back and review what I just talked about for an hour. So it's up to you. It's up to you if you want to stick with me. Otherwise, you can just wait and watch the recording. That's probably better. <laughs> because when I show you examples of I am here, you, you know, I, I, I talked about that at the beginning. So it's good to see you, though. Uh, sorry, Professor. What did you say? Which one is better for you? Uh, it's up to you. I think it's probably better for you because I, I think it's probably better for you to 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 just leave and watch the recording later because oh, okay. I'm I'm showing examples of sort of the rhythm and structure that I already lectured about for an hour. So oh, okay. I, it's it's probably better to watch that before you look at examples. You know. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I don't you. want to tell you, I don't want to tell you to leave, but I want to respect your time. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, no. I know. I know. Thank you. Okay. okay. You got it. Sure. Yeah. And I'll finish soon. So I'll send out a message as soon as the um, recording is ready and I'll do it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. So good to see you. you. Good to see you too. All right. So that was our, that was Emily Dickinson, right? Famous for, for using rhyme in fun and interesting ways. Famous for using the stressed and unstressed rhythm, uh, unstressed stress rhythm that we've been talking about. 
and uh, at the end of the 19th century, really important figure in uh, women's history in the United States of America and certainly in poetic history in the United States. So another poet that we've got is Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes, right? African-American poet, black poet. Some basic information about Langston. He was born in Joplin, Missouri, right? He was born right at the turn of the 20th century. So born in 1901 and died in 1967. As a young man, he moved to, to New York City and he lived in Harlem, a historically African-American black area of New York City and is strongly associated with this part of American history called the Harlem Renaissance. This was during the 1920s and 30s, uh, after the end of slavery in the United States. And some um, uh, African Americans, some Black people, had been able to achieve some amount of economic freedom, some amount of economic success. And Harlem was one of those places, right, where you had Black-owned businesses, Black stores, Black restaurants, Black cafes. So there's really sort of um, powerful and beautiful uh, black culture started to develop uh, uh, specifically around music, poetry, uh, literature and all that good stuff. And of course, one of the great gifts of, of the world uh, to the world from the United States and specifically from black people in the United States is jazz music. Right? Jazz music is very often associated with the Harlem Renaissance and the 1920s. And as I say here in the third point, so uh, Langston Hughes represented the voices of Black Americans who had only been freed from slavery about 30 years before. And Black Americans who were not able to leave the South were also still experiencing tremendous prejudice and injustice, right? So even though slavery was over in the Southern states, it was horrible, horrible racism existed uh, until the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1965. So Langston Hughes did live to see the passage of the Civil Rights Act when black people were given the right to vote and uh, a lot of other rights that they had been denied historically. And uh, Langston Hughes's poetry is connected to all this, right? It's connected to the history of African-Americans, some of the deeper meaning and the deeper themes that they were going through, and also some of the specific rhythms connected to the music and the language that black people were using, right? So as I say here, uh, his poetry is often described as writing jazz poetry, right? Because it uses some of the same rhythms and the meter of jazz music, which uh, has repeated themes, driving rhythm and surprising improvisation. And uh, a theme of this is in a poem, um, here's a poem uh, 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 that I'll, I'll read just a short example from. And you can see some of these repetitions, right? Um, some of these key words and some of the rhyming. Uh, so here's just a, a short section of, of his poem as an example of some of the jazz meter here. So, oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. And notice, even though he's using a sort of new and improvisational style, you're still gonna see I am's, right? Because the English language loves them so much. It, all this repetition in this, this stanza down here, um, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, I am, right? Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. But then he breaks that rhythm in different times. And this is what we mean by that jazz poetry, right? When you get a rhythm going, 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 and then you change, and then it goes and goes and goes, and then you change a little bit more, and then you come back and go to the rhythm. This is what he really loved to do. Right? And again, I'll read it again, just sort of try and hear the rhythm. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. 
for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. And that last line is pure iams, right? Except the dream that's almost dead today. That's iambic pentameter, right? That's Shakespeare, right? That's, that's 10 syllables in the line. And you can really see how he's changing the rhythm. He has one line that's its own stanza, the free, question mark. And then notice again, this, this says you're a thing where I'm talking about punctuation is really important because that third stanza that I have on the screen here, who said the free question mark, not me question mark, surely not me question mark, the million uh, and it, it breaks the rhythm completely, right? We have to stop every single time we see uh, one of those question marks, we have to stop and give a full says you're a, right? But then Notice, after that, the millions who have nothing for our pay, we get enjambment almost all the way down and we get that rhythm building, 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 building back up, right? So again, all of these are choices that he's making to, to have it flow and go fast and then, mm, 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 and then flow again. Just that last stanza, for example, Right. No, I'll read it one more time, just so you can really hear how he's building. And this isn't even the whole poem. Again, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see this poem again in one of the lessons in Canvas. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free. Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Dude's a genius. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Dude is a genius. Uh, we will definitely talk more about one of his most famous poems called Harlem. Um, yeah, anyway, he's amazing. He's amazing. Uh, in one of the lessons, I'll show you, uh, show you a YouTube video where someone is um, reading this poem, a black, a black male who's reading the poem for you. Um, yeah. And again, I'm uh, here. I've just got examples of highlighting some of the rhymes, right? Because, uh, as I said, right, meter is not just about syllable and stress and sound, but but the rhyme also gives some some feeling for the rhythm and how the poem comes together. Last person I'm going to talk about, and then and then my my long solo lecture for today is over. <laughs> And the last poet I want to talk to you guys about is Walt Whitman. Again, like I shared, um, when I got to university, you know, it was a really important time in my own life. I, uh, I could not wait to get out and uh, away from home for a lot of reasons. Um, and I was just so excited to learn stuff. I was so excited to learn about the things that I wanted to learn about. And I already shared some of what my experience was with doing theater and, and having Shakespeare for the first time. And uh, Walt Whitman was, for me, we didn't get to read Walt Whitman in my high school. Um, but when we got Walt Whitman in college, I remember my first year at university, I was just amazed, 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 amazed. Um, so I'm happy to share him with you. Again, you could sort of say really, you know, the United States, um, especially English speaking United States, 
the uh, Declaration of Independence of 1776. Uh, there were people here before that, of course, uh, but a lot of the identity of the United States was tied up or connected with uh, Great Britain, with England. And uh, so a lot of the early literature, a lot of the, 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 the writing, the poetry, the, the, the novels that came out of the United States um, is often connected to England. Right. So, of course, it's, it's American. There is there's American language and American literature before 1776. There were people here um, before that. There were Native Americans and, and French speakers and Spanish speakers on this continent way before that, too. So it's important to know I'm, I'm not um, I'm not pretending that everything begins with 1776. And yet the sort of national character, the national identity, right? What it means to be truly American and not just a colony of Great Britain shows up or, or, or manifests in American literature, um, you know, in poetry with Walt Whitman and, and in fiction with, with uh, Mark Twain. Uh, but as I say here, right, uh, Walt Whitman was born in New York, Long Island and born in 1819. So not very long after the Declaration of Independence and the, uh, the United States fights the war against Great Britain for independence, achieves independence, is its own country. And now it's been a few decades after that, right? And this sort of national identity uh, of a country that is free, free and its own thing for the first time really starts to develop. And as I say here in the second slide, right, um, he strongly believed in a link between poet, between poetry, between the poet and the and their society, their country, right, and therefore he very strongly identified himself as an American poet, right, and he's often considered to be one of the very first queer voices in the United States. He wrote lovingly about both men and women. Although he never spoke directly about his own sexuality, right? He never said, I'm gay, I love men, or I, I love men, I love women, whatever. His poetry absolutely presents men and women as sort of beautiful, um, yeah. And again, some people found it offensive. Uh, some people found it just sort of a, a commentary on sort of, um, what? on trying to celebrate all of life's beauty, right? Everybody, and not just thinking about things very strictly in only men, only women, only men and women getting married, right? Um, so like I said, I'm not presenting this as a way to be controversial. I'm not sort of giving you my opinion or an argument, but I do think it's important to understand that when he was writing, the way that he was writing, was really new and important and interesting for the United States at, at that time, right? Uh, and if you're interested in that, there's this very famous poem here that says, I sing the body electric, right? I sing the body electric uh, that people talk about all the time. Uh, now, just in terms of what we've been talking about in this class, rhythm and meter, uh, he is often called the father of quote unquote free verse poetry. Now, some people might like this because <laughs> free verse means breaking away from the traditional features of poetry like rhyme, rhythm, and meter. So if, if people were watching this lecture going, oh my God, I am an iambic pentameter and what is going on? I don't, <laughs> how do I know about syllable and stress? Walt Whitman basically said, forget it. Don't worry about it. Write whatever you want to write. Feel however you want to feel. Say whatever you want to say and organize it in a poetic way, right? Um, so the traditional features that we've been talking about in this lecture today uh, aren't really present. We can't analyze his poem, his poetry for I am's, right? We can definitely analyze it for sounds and, and imagery and symbol, but, but a strict structure and strict rhyme, forget about it. For example, <laughs> this is a short poem of his, right? Only four lines. This is called Sometimes with the One I Love. Notice right away how long these lines are. If I even just count the syllables, um, sometimes with one I love, I fill myself with rage for fear, I effuse unreturned love. 21 syllables. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not even an, an even number of syllables. We know it can't be an I am, right? I am's are two syllables. So you could have two syllable, four, six, eight, 10, 12, but you can't have 21 syllables and have I am's. It's not possible. How about the next line? But now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. 22, I think I counted right. <laughs> Um, so I'll just read through it as a point to say this is an example of free verse and and often when students start to learn American poetry and they're like where are the rhymes oh my god what happened it's because they're reading free verse so here's sometimes with one I love by Walt Whitman sometimes with one I love I fill myself with rage for fear I effuse unreturned love but now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. I loved a certain person ardently and my love was not returned. Yet out of that, I have written these songs. So how do we know, right? How do we know the rhythm? And, and with free verse like this, you know, enjambment, cesira, and sound are really kind of the most important guides, right? So. How do we know? Well, that the commas are big clues that he wants you to slow down here. I don't have any enjambment. He, he puts commas at the end or a full stop at the end of all the lines. He's playing with, with parentheses. Parentheses, things that are in parentheses are usually said kind of like an afterthought, kind of like an idea, right? That's the way we tend to use parentheses in, in writing, both in and out of poetry. So again, I'll read it and notice Hopefully you can hear the difference between this and something like Langston Hughes or something like Fire and Ice. Sometimes with one I love by Walt Whitman. Sometimes with one I love, I fill myself with rage for fear I effuse unreturned love. But now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. I loved a certain person ardently and my love was not returned. Yet out of that, I have written these songs. Right? So I can say in a way, um, if you love poetry that rhymes, right? If you're one of those people that's like, I don't understand new poetry. Why doesn't it rhyme? <laughs> Where's my rhythm? You can kind of blame Walt Whitman for that in the United States. He uh, he is, like I said, the godfather, the father of free verse in the United States of America. Right? All right. Uh, I've also got some interesting links that you can look at if you want more information uh, about poetic meter and poetic rhyme scheme. We'll talk more about this next week. Um, next week, I'm going to introduce the, the big poetry project for this class and kind of bring it all together. Uh, but I do have some more lessons in Canvas for you uh, to practice both responding to poetry and analyzing some poetic elements. So um, yeah, I'd say look at the lessons. I'm going to make my face big here now. So yeah, look at those lessons in Canvas. Um, message me, email me, or text me if you have any questions about how to do them or what I'm asking. Um, yeah, and hopefully this, this video was, was useful and interesting to you as you learn more about poetic rhythm uh, and meter, right? So, so uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Uh, email me, text me if you need me. You know where to find me. Otherwise, I will see you all later.